Good afternoon, good good midday. If you're in California, uh, welcome uh, to uh, the second of the webinar series um, coordinated by Bayana Summit Graduate School and the University of California Berkeley Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Welcome, we're very glad to have you with us. Um, today's session, I, by the way, uh, my name is Asifa Qureshi Landis. Uh, I am the chair of the Board of Trustees of Bayana Islamic Graduate School. I'm also a professor, um, not in California, out in the cold Wisconsin, uh, Tun, uh, tundra, but uh, but I'm happy to virtually be with all of you in California, those of you who are there, and I'm very, very happy to be hosting and moderating our presentation today. This, as I said, is the second in a series of webinars that Bayan and um, the Center for Medicine Studies program has put together on topics of interest to, uh, in American Islam. And uh, last week we talked about uh, civic engagement and voting uh, last month. And this month we are talking about reason and revelation in Islam, theoretical frameworks and lived realities. Uh, we plan to have one of these every month for the duration of the academic year. So please look out for upcoming events and we will actually give more details about the January event at the end of this session. But now I'd like to introduce um, our, our two speakers. Uh, the first speaker this afternoon is Asad Ahmed, who uh, is professor of, professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at University of California at Berkeley. He's also the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, um, also at Berkeley. Um, he has a degree uh, from Yale and his PhD from Princeton. Um, he specializes in early Islamic social history and pre-modern Islamic intellectual history. Um, he specializes, focuses on rationalist disciplines such as philosophy, logic, legal theories, astronomy, um, multiple publications, including the religious elite of the early Islamic Hejaz, Avicenna's Deliverance, Logic, uh, and upcoming, I hope I say this right, Asad Palimpsets of themselves, Logic and Commentary in Muslim India forthcoming. Um, and, uh, and so he's our first speaker. I will introduce Nahyan now so that we've got all of the bio information up front and then we'll just go smoothly through both presenters. Um, our next presenter is Nahyan Fancy. He is professor of Middle East and Comparative History at DePaul University in Indiana. He has a PhD from the University of Notre Dame. He uh, researches in pre-1500 science and medicine and intellectual history. Um, he's um, looked at the intersections of philosophy, theology, and medical physiology, um, especially in a particular um, scholar, 13th century physician jurist, uh, Ibn al-Nafis, um, who worked on the transit of blood, pulmonary transit of blood. Um, and uh, he's also the author of Science and Religion in Mamluk, Egypt, uh, Ibn al-Nafis, Pulmonary Transit and Body Res Resurrection in 2013. And uh, it continues to work now on um, the uh, ev evolution of medical commentaries in post-1250 Islamic societies. This is a historian we've got here, um, looking now at the, um, you know, the exchange in, in history and the appropriation of these uh, trajectories to um, Latin Europe in the Renaissance. So as I said, our presentation today is on reason and revelation in Islam, specifically theoretical frameworks and lived realities. And we'll start with Professor Asad. Um, welcome, Professor Asad. Thank you. Thank you. Ahmed. Asad Ahmed. Thank you, Professor Qureshi Landis, and, and welcome all to, uh, to this event. I see some uh, friends in the audience. Uh, thank you for coming and also, of course, some students and also new people I've never met. So thank you all for coming and for joining us. And my thanks also goes to my colleague, uh, Professor Fancy, and to the entire team of Bayan and the CMS. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly. I have not, um, I, I've thought, of course, about the topic for quite some time, obviously, uh, but I've not really prepared a formal paper to read out. It's, uh, it's a range of reflections that have animated the way I've thought about the issue for quite some time. So I'm going to present uh, the matter uh, first by complicating uh, the issue. Uh, the question of reason and revelation in Islam for me is one that is fraught with uh, an issue of uh, possible category mistakes. Um, I was asked uh, to write by a dear colleague a paper in 2016, if I remember correctly, uh, on the question of what was philosophy in Muslim India. Uh, the question is similar to the question of what was science in, uh, in Islam. Um, and when I began to write that paper, one of the things that I, the problems I ran into was the issue of what am I searching for? Because if I take the expression uh, philosophy or any of its cognates in Western languages and look for philosophy in the Islamic tradition, I either begin with certain definitional components that are already available to me. And at that point, I basically look for whether Muslims in the pre-modern age were doing something similar to what we are calling philosophy now. 
And you know that exercise can cer certainly be performed, but the question really is not at that point what was philosophy or science in Islam. The question really is whether Muslims did philosophy and science the way we conceptualize and categorize them today. So um, the answer to that question is already a given. You know, you have a, a category and a concept in place, and then you search for it in in in, a, in the sources of an alternative tradition. Um, there are a number of other possibilities too. For example, one can designate a particular term, starting from from the tradition itself. Let's say hikma or falsafa or something similar, and say that I identify that as philosophy. And at that point, you would sit and you would determine on the basis of the sources what uh, the Muslim tradition uh, uniformly or or through various uh, differences uh, considered to be hikma and falsafa. But that I think also is an arbitrary way of entering um, the question because you have um, taken a particular term um, and you have designated that as philosophy and then you have simply unfolded the term to answer the question. Um, and so um, the short of it is that getting off uh, on, you know, get, getting a start off on this uh, question of what was philosophy and science in Muslim India, I found to be a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, at the end of the day, I settled on uh, a method, which is that I looked at one of the last works, one of the latest works produced in Muslim India by a scholar called Siddiq Hassan Khan. He wrote many, many works, including one work called the Abjad al-Ulum, in which he gives a classification of the various sciences and how they function in relation to each other. It's a very large uh, uh, two volume work, um, at least in the edition that I have. And my enterprise began, uh, became to, to see how he's categorizing and classifying the different sciences. Um, and the basic, basic argument was that once I have outlined the different and various ways in which he categorizes and cal classifies sciences, to designate one grouping in an informed fashion to be philosophy. Now that is, uh, that is a, a, a kind of a gap or an epistemological leap that uh, I'm willing to accept as, uh, as a starting point. Uh, the way th uh, that leap would work would be for me to say that anything else, any other classification, any other grouping would then not be called philosophy by me. Uh, in the process, I basically gave up the expression philosophy and science. Uh, in, in, in a part of the article, which is slightly tongue in cheek, I basically say that, that the expression it has cultural capital and those who wish to have it can have it. Uh, what I'm trying to show here is that the Muslim tradition was thinking of the relationship of different disciplines in a particular fashion. Um, those relationships are what I want to bring to the fore today. Um, and I, uh, and of course, I'll be happy to elaborate more during the question and answer session if I have not been clear. Uh, the main point of these preliminary remarks is to show that the, the question that we that were asked about what is philosophy and what is science or what is the relationship of reason and revelation to Islam is actually fraught with certain post-enlightenment categories um, that can sometimes do violence to the traditions and, and texts that we are reading. So it's best to start to read the texts uh, from, from within and then to see whether, you know, you know what would the texts reveal in terms of their own internal structures and classifications and so on. Uh, I should also say, by the way, that there is no one classification scheme that is available to the tradition. I'm presenting the one that is preferred by Sidi Hassan Khan, who's looking bad, back at the whole range of the tradition uh, and cites a number of other sources along the way. So um, I'm going to share with you um, this uh, one, one main classification scheme that is embraced by Sidi Hassan Khan. Let me share my, uh, my slides, my, my uh, uh, tree here. Uh, following that classification scheme, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the different disciplines are understood to be related to each other. Um, there's an issue of what is a root discipline and what is a branch discipline and what that means. So I'll give you some quotations from text so that we may understand how these relationships hold in the tradition. And um, at the end of uh, in the second part of my talk, I'm going to shift to talk about uh, um, a particular text uh, uh, by a very important Muslim theologian called Iji and the commentary by Jojani, uh, uh, Sharif al Jojani, um, on their conception of the role of astronomy and science in relation to religion, or, you know, the, the revealed sources. And perhaps we can all reflect on that together. So that's basically what I'm trying to do here, just basically trying to sort of shake up our way of thinking about science and philosophy in the Islamic tradition. So with that, very briefly, let me here share with you. Uh, this is uh, 
So Sidi Hassan Khan, and some, the, some of this, of course, will be familiar to, to some of you, um, argues um, that his preferred classification of the disciplines um, moves, as you can see, from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. Um, the former on the left side uh, is a means, according to him, to the latter. This is not new to him. He is elaborating on received tradition that what you find in writing is a means to achieve uh, that which is an expression, which is a means to achieve or to come to terms to that which is conceptualized in the mind, which at the end of the day is a means to achieve, um, is, is a means to a specific individuation, things that we find in experimental reality. And similarly, what's on the left signifies what's to the right. So writing signifies expression, which signifies what's in your mind and what's in, that signifies that which you find in experimental reality. When we get to extra mental reality, um, objects that are not uh, produced because of my mental concoction, he divides disciplines that deal with these kinds of uh, objects of knowledge into two types, the theoretical and the practical. And the theoretical he divides into what he calls hikmi and what he calls shari, and similarly with what is practical. Um, uh, that kind of knowledge, which is hikmi from the expression hikma and uh, that which is revealed or shari. So this is, these are the four subclasses of bodies of knowledge that he presents. Um, as you can see, he does not consider revealed knowledge in this classification, shari knowledge to be what he calls hikmah. So whatever we're going to call shari knowledge because of this classification scheme has to be separated from what we're going to call hikmi knowledge. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, if you wish, you can use the expression philosophy to refer to hikmi knowledge or to shari knowledge, that's irrelevant to me. As long as we understand that the classification relations are operating in a certain fashion, we don't apply those same, same notions to the other classification scheme. Now within these uh, different bodies of knowledge, he also has a further um, um, set of uh, arguments. And one important aspect of it is that he says that there are certain bodies of knowledge that we call the asl or the, the root and others that he calls furu or the branches. And I will, uh, in, the, in the next slide, I will try to explain to you what, what is meant by asl and far, the, the, the root and, and the branch. Uh, and again, these uh, root and branch relationships are also not always uniform. They're different classifications that are presented by different traditions. According to Siddi Hassan Khan, uh, he prefers to think of, for example, tabiyyat or physics as a root branch, sorry, as a, as a root discipline. And under it, he would, uh, the, the investigation of rainbows and medicine, astrology, alchemy, botany, and so on, he presents as branches. And similarly, the divine science is presented as a root discipline. And under it, he classifies heresiography, signs of prophecy, souls of angels, eschatology, and so on. So this is, um, just to start off, um, a, a quick uh, presentation of his classification schemes, right? He has Shari knowledge and he has Hikmi knowledge. And among those two types, there's theoretical knowledge and there's practical knowledge. And then within those, uh, those broad um, classification schemes, we have root disciplines and we have branch disciplines. So let's come to what he means by root and branch so that we may understand how the disciplines are related to each other and how they may in fact affect each other. And by the way, these are roots and branches. By that, he means epistemological priorities, not necessarily priority in terms of uh, ultimate nobility, right? So a particular branch, uh, some, a particular discipline may be a branch to a root, but its ultimate objective may be nobler than its own root. Uh, so we're talking about how do you come to the knowledge of things and how do they understand this relationship among the different disciplines? So here are some quotations uh, very quickly that might give you the material from the horse's mouth. In order to talk about roots and branches, I have here uh, presented to you an extract from uh, an usul al-fiqh work, a work on legal theory called the Musallam al-Thubut. It's written by a scholar of the late 17th century from India. Um, and he explains roots and branches in the following fashion. He says, then this discipline, namely the discipline of legal theory, is the compressed indicants, the adilla ijma'liya of jurisprudence, of fiqh, which are needed when the expressed indicants, the adilla tafsiliya, that are specific to each problema, are made to be congruent with or to fold over their legal effects, the ahkam. This is so because when the proof is rendered according to the first syllogistic form, the major premise is taken from the roots 
regardless of whether it is exactly a specific problem of legal theory or is subsumed under it or is taken up from a number of problema. When the proof is rendered according to the arrangement of the acceptive syllogism, the entailment is taken from it, namely from the roots. This is now he gives an example of what he means. This is like our statement that alms are obligatory because God, the elevated said, give alms. For when we intend to make it congruent with or fold over its legal effect, we say alms are commanded by God, the elevated. Everything commanded by the elevated is obligatory because the command is meant for obligation. So this major premise is taken from a problem of legal theory. Basically, what he's saying is that when you're going to derive legal effects, you know, that arms are obligatory, you would derive them on the basis of unfolding universal uh, propositions, which is the subject matter of legal theory. So the roots are basically those, you know, compressed propositions, which if you were to investigate them further, will reveal the entire set and entire body of the ahkam. So you can have a, a proposition such as um, al-amr lil-wujub, right? Commands are for obligation. This would be uh, a dalil ijmali or a compressed general universal rule. And out of this, you might be able to, you would be able to pronounce different kinds of judgments about various kinds of commands that are found in the scripture. So this is the relationship of roots to branches that is being expressed. And it's expressed also in the Isharat of Avicenna and various other, oh, sorry, Tusi's commentary on the Isharat of Avicenna and in other places, right? So certain higher epistemologically universal body is going to unfold to reveal other kinds of sciences. And that's what I was showing you in the last slide. Now there's a, a bunch of other questions that would arise for us at this point, because of course there are indeed different epistemologies and different ways of approaching the same set of problems. And it seems to me that for, for generally speaking for, for the classification schemes that I have run into, again, not always, but generally speaking, uh, the tradition is willing to accommodate different ways of getting to the truth. Um, and here's an example that you find in the object. And let me read this out for you. So he states, as for the philosophy of illumination, the hikmat al-ishraq, and by the way, the word hikmah is being used here. Well, it is among the philosophical disciplines, um, the, or I should say falsafi disciplines, um, in the same manner as mysticism is among the Islamic disciplines, the ulum islamiyya. Just as physics and first philosophy, al-hikmah at-tabi'iyya wal-ilahiyya, among the philosophical disciplines are in the same manner as kalam is among the Islamic disciplines. The explanation of this is that the greatest happiness and highest rank of the rational soul is the knowledge of the creator. In sum, the greatest happiness is the knowledge of the beginning and the end. And the way to this knowledge is in two manners. One of them, is the way of the people of discursive investigation and proof, the Ahl al-Nazar wal istidlal And the second is the way of the people of spiritual practice and effort, Ahl al so, excuse me, Ahl uh, wal Mujahadat. Uh, if those who tread the first path attach themselves to a community among the communities of the prophets, may there be blessings and peace upon them, then they are the mutakallimun. Otherwise, they are the peripatetic philosophers, the hukama al mashaun If those who tread the second path conform in their practice to the judgments of the divine text, then they are the mystics. Otherwise, they are the illuminationist philosophers. That which obtains from the first path is that one seeks perfection by means of the theoretical faculty and to rise in its four stations, and that which obtains from the second path is that one seeks perfection by means of the practical faculty and to rise in their ranks. So the point is that the illuminationist tradition is being presented as an, an analogy to the Kalam tradition and the Ishtaki tradition is being presented as a second type and an analogy to the Falsafa tradition. So what I'm trying to, to, to point out here is that even within these classification schemes that we find, we have different epistemologies and different ways of arriving at truth that is presented in the sources. Um, because I'm, I'm running out of time, um, uh, I wouldn't give you all these quotes, but let me read this one and perhaps one more, and then I'll begin to close. I, I don't think I'll get to the second part of my talk, but we can talk about it in the question and answer session about how astronomy is received in Kalam texts, if you guys wish. Um, from the Sulam al-Ulum, from the same author, Muhibbal uh, al-Bihari, um, in one of the commentaries, we find the following. The communication or conveyance of meaning is accomplished only by means of signification, right? So when we talk to each other, 
we use expressions to signify our ideas or even objects outside of the mind. This is to guard against the impression that aims to suggest that the logician investigates only the explicative statement, proof, and the nature of the ordering of the two, and the explicative statement and proof do not depend on utterances, for the argument and investigation pertains only to meanings. So what is the reason that utterances and their sig significations are mentioned in logic, though this is not among its tasks? The explanation for guarding against the impression is that teaching and learning and the conveyance and reception of meaning in the sciences and elsewhere occur only by means of the manifestation of what is in the heart of the one who possesses it. In other words, if you're going to communicate, even in logic, you need expressions to communicate what is in your heart. But logic is not really concerned with expressions. Thus, one must have utterances that signify the sought meanings so that communication may, may come to obtain. So now comes an objection because of, of course, you don't always have a discursive means of uh, communication. If it is said that there is communication for the illuminationists, right, the Ishraqiyun, without utterances, by means of intuition and the illumination of the heart, we say that this path is not easy and available. It's not possible for everyone. In communication, that which is predominantly in usage are utterances. In this case, communication is limited in relation to us, it is not communication simpliciter. Thus the author would not be challenged with the argument that the communication of the necessary with the prophets and friends is by means of revelation and inspiration. So the point that's being made here again, like the previous quotation I gave you, is that one might argue that in logic, you know, in, in these discursive methods, you talk about language, but logic is not really about language, it's about modes of argumentation and reasoning. And the other argument is that, well, the illuminationists who also have knowledge of things, they seem not to communicate by means of expressions, right? Ordinary expressions and discursive means. The author is not dismissing the illuminationist method. He's simply saying that it's a distinct one. This is not something that is accessible to everyone. In fact, it might even not be possible for everyone to achieve. Um, a similar idea is presented, which I will not elaborate on because I'm really out of time, uh, by Fakhreddin Razi in his work on physiognomy. And we can look at this quote in the question answer session. The short of it, is that he points out that I can teach you physiognomy, which is an art uh, that, that involves looking at the outward features of a person and thereby determining what their inner character is. And then there too, he draws two distinct, uh, distinctive epistemologies. One of them is that which is accessible to the awliya or the friends of God. They would be in the presence of someone and without using the, uh, the methods of physiognomy that can be taught that are grounded in uh, tabiyyat and physics and in medicine, uh, in humoral theory and so on, without drawing on that, they'll be able to come to the same conclusion. But he points out very much like the code that I just gave you that that mode of doing physiognomy is mostly inaccessible to people and it cannot be learned and taught. So let me let me wrap up what I mean, I've given you a lot of data here, but let me let me give you the, the bottom line here. Uh, what I've, um, what I'm present, what the argument I'm presenting here is that if we begin to talk about science and philosophy in the Islamic tradition, uh, searching for what those disciplines, what, what those categories are, can be a very difficult task because we might begin with certain conceptual prejudices that are presented in post-enlightenment uh, modes of uh, categorizing knowledge and thinking about knowledge. One way to do so is to go into the sources themselves and not to search for specific expressions because taking those expressions and unfolding them would also be a pretty arbitrary job. Um, what I feel one needs to do is to go into the sources, look closely at the classification scheme, see how and under what circumstances different classification schemes let certain disciplines relate to each other. What did they mean by roots and branches, which in the end would mean what epistemological outcome would have an influence on the epistemological outcome of another discipline. Um, and then along the way, one would also be open to the possibility that different classification schemes do not rule out the possibility of knowledge in other classification schemes. Illuminationism, for example, and the of Sufism, for example, are not being presented by these scholars as methods that are, uh, that are, uh, you know, th th that should be dismissed, but they have their own place and their distinct epistemology. What we call science and philosophy, it seems, is what, what is non-revelationary uh, and that which relates to discursive modes of reasoning. So I'll stop there and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and challenges to this presentation and I hope there are. And then we can sort all of this out in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um...
Amir, can you spotlight me again? Back to me. Yep. All right. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Ahmed. Um, I'm just going to run straight through to Professor Fancy so we can get both um, substantive content out there and then we can have Q&A. I put in the chat if you have any questions. You guys are, there's over 100 of you here, almost 100 of you here. So um, we're not taking direct questions from everybody, but we are happy to get questions. So please just put them in the chat to me. They'll go directly to me and then I will compile them. Um, and we will ask the, the presenters um, accordingly at the end. So um, I'll just go to Professor Fancy. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor uh, Karshan Lendis, and thanks, uh, Professor Ahmed, and thanks to uh, Dr. Sheikh for uh, inviting me and to be part of this really exciting adventure and initiative uh, from uh, Bayan and uh, Berkeley. Um, so I usually talk extremely fast. Uh, I'm going to take a, <laughs> I'm going to try to slow down, uh, but if I don't, I'll take comfort in the fact that this is being recorded. So yeah. at some point, <laughs> if people yeah. are interested, they can go back to it and pause. Um, I'm actually going to build upon uh, uh, what Asa just uh, uh, touched on. I am going to use the category but I actually agree with a lot of what Asad said. I'm only going to put the caveat as follows, that even our modern categories of science, medicine, philosophy, have a genealogical relationship to what emerges out of the earlier Greek and the Islamic tradition and the Latin tradition. Things evolve and change considerably. So what we specify very in confined manners as science now is not exactly what it is, but it's still genealogically related. Uh, there's a great article by Andrew Cunningham from the 1980s where he analogized, and it really appeals to me because I play bridge myself, the card game. And he analogizes the relationship between science and in our modern context and what Newton was doing, and Newton was doing something called natural philosophy to uh, bridge the modern card game to whist, which was being played by Jane Austen characters and stuff, right? That they come out of uh, bridge comes out of whist, but you cannot play whist by the rules of bridge and vice versa, right? So with that caveat, I am going to use these terms broadly, but exactly with what Asa just said, uh, that we need to understand the classification schemes of uh, knowledge of these earlier scholars in their own terms. They also disagreed and differed on many, many aspects about them, and we need to bear that in mind. Now, having said that, I have a few goals, which are really all based on, uh, oops, let's see. Can, is, did my next screen come up? Good. Okay, good. good. All right. Uh, I have a few goals uh, uh, that I wanted to highlight uh, as part of uh, what's uh, um, uh, what I'm hoping at least to, to achieve. Uh, and they are all meant to actually go against certain classical notions that people have about uh, the relationship between Islamic medicine and or medicine in Islamic societies, you know, using shorthand for Islamic medicine that way, and uh, earlier traditions and later traditions and what was going on within. So uh, my goals are as follows, and they're actually meant to challenge what's usually out there. And I'll give you some quotes. And they're pretty active debates. Most recently, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf three years ago recycled some old claims about the death of philosophy and its exclusion from religious education. Um, and then they're all over the place since 9/11 uh, in in. Many many, many forums, including, you know, publications in the Middle East, as well as uh, New York Times, The Guardian, etc. So here are the goals for today. Uh, I want to provide one or two examples of new developments in medical theory that moved medicine in Islamic societies beyond earlier Greek and Galenic understandings. I want to show that medicine and philosophy did not actually part ways, again, with that caveat about how we define them, etc., but that there is a genealogical relationship that so some elements are picked up show that medical texts were studied in madrasas and give an example of how to really start to break down those barriers and disciplinary boundaries that we might have that how these, uh, what we will classify and I'm very, very careful here, what we from a modern perspective may go back and say, oh, this is a philosophical text. Oh, this is a medical text. Oh, this is a religious text. Show that the, how they actually mutually communicate and build upon one another. And a lot of it goes back to how they understood the theories of knowledge, the roots, the branches, and many, many other facets about it that uh, Asad was just talking about. So these are my goals. I'm going to do uh, the latter by hopefully giving two examples. But if I don't get to the second example, I'll just stick to one uh, um, at the moment. I'm sorry, I just thought I'd put a timer in for myself so I know uh, how to uh, go. So. Uh, some of the stuff that's otherwise out there, and I'm going to do a quick whirlwind 45 second tour of this, uh, is uh, as follows, right? There's the old classic notion that Islamic 
physicians never challenged anything that the Greeks had left behind for them. And they just, you know, treasured it up and carefully systematized it. That was in 1930s. Uh, this is 2011, pretty much the same thing being said, uh, right? Because a lot of this stuff gets recycled uh, uh, in, in many ways. And I'm only actually right now focusing on who would be classified at least broadly as specialists of science and medicine in Islamic societies. Popular media will just explode and, and pick those things up. Another one is on divorce of philosophy and medicine. This is A.C. Iskander, who basically says, you know, by the 11th century, people, physicians became trained in theology and philosophy got dismissed out. And that actually he goes on to say basically led to sort of a decline. Uh, Barons of the Safe uh, in 89 said pretty much the same thing. She says, you know, the erudite physician of earlier periods was sort of replaced into the erudite faqih, the jurist who also studied medicine while the practicing physician belonged to the class of craftsmen. So the medical craft, here's a crucial point, was thus deprived of the scholarly ground on which it once flourished as a way of explaining as to why there were no new developments or challenges to Galen afterwards. Uh, it's exclusion from madrasas. This is George Magdisi's famous book on Rise of Colleges, where he basically says neither the madrasa nor its cognate institutions harbored any but the religious sciences and their ancillary subjects. And of course, he made this hard dichotomy between religious and foreign, and medicine and philosophy fit under um, the foreign category. Um, um, I think that, that th those are the kind of, I want to again emphasize, I'm disagreeing and going against all of this, and I'm not the only one. Many, many people have, us included, uh, uh, in, in, in various ways. Uh, uh, but these are the kinds of tropes that continue to exist and keep getting recycled, uh, unfortunately. And so I'm going to give you some concrete examples on how, how to move uh, beyond that. My current project actually works on commentaries on the Ibn Sina's canon of medicine and an abridgment of his called the epitome. These are the most widely used and circulated medical works across Western Eurasia, uh, used by physicians in training of physicians uh, as reference guides. And when I say Western Eurasia, I also mean Latin Europe, as well as, of course, uh, people in uh, across uh, what would be Arabic, Persian, Hebrew speaking, and of course, Urdu later on, et cetera, right? Uh, they were translated into them as well in, in many of these languages. The canon of medicine, for example, was being used to teach medicine in Leiden University in Netherlands well into the 18th century, 100 years after Harvey and Descartes. Uh, these are the eight commentators that I'm actually working on. Four are on the canon, the top four. Uh, the uh, next four are on the epitome, this abridged text. Uh, the color coding is to give you that sense already to start breakdown boundaries. Green signifies actually a person who's trained in what we would call philosophy, theology, and is not a practicing physician, but wrote a commentary on a medical work, right? So those would be two, Fakhreddin al-Razi and Jamaluddin al Um, The blue quotes practicing physicians, but who did uh, we know some things about their biographies and from some of their works, we know they were they received some training or were familiar with philosophical works such as Ibn Sina's big compendia, including the Isharat and the Shifa and et cetera and others, but did not write any works that we would quote unquote put under that category of philosophy, right? Versus yellow are actually those who did. They were practicing physicians who also wrote commentaries and other philosophical and logic works, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so most of these uh, commentaries do not exist in modern editions, but only in manuscripts, uh, though now more and more easily accessible as many of them are digitized. Um, to give you a sense of the size, the shortest commentary is Fakhreddin al-Razi's commentary book on book one of the canon. And it's around 90,000 words, which is about 200 pages of a modern you know, kind of uh, book. And it's all in manuscript. Um, the longest are those of Ibn Nafis and Qutb al Shirazi, which come in about 1 million words each, uh, right? So about a thousand page book or more. What does that say? Well, all the earlier claims that you uh, read about how medicine didn't go beyond or anything, these works have never been examined. Uh, so these claims are being made without actually having read any of these. Um, I want to say in a very humble moment, in a very seriously humble moment, that I've been working on these for over eight years, and I've barely read five to 10% of what is contained in these manuscripts, right? So all of the stuff that I'm going to share and some of the advances and stuff is based on just that portion of it. And uh, I think uh, Asad can correct me on this at some point, that outside of the historians of Yunani medicine in India and other parts of South Asia, uh, such as the great Zillah Rahman, on the academic side of things, particularly in Western Europe, I can probably feel reasonably safe to say that I've probably studied these in content more than 
most other people uh, in the over the last century. So, uh, and these eight commentaries are only about 15% or less of the medical works uh, produced during these just three centuries. So we're talking about a fraction of a fraction uh, that has been read and claims are being made about them. All right, in terms of the commentators and where they lived, again, not to give a sense that this is meant as a big map and, and to orient the movements are, these are the movements on the arrows designate the movements of the actual scholar themselves, scholars themselves, not their works, which of course spread even beyond, right? And to give you a sense of the scale uh, from Asamarkans to Herat is a thousand kilometers or 620 miles, right? And that's just a fraction of what Fakhradin himself traveled, right? Uh, the point of showing this map and all this movement is to give you a sense of these are not eight individuals sitting on their own alone digging up stuff, right? These are communities, they're part of communities of scholars that interact with and build upon one another, right? So dismissing any of the stuff as, oh, it's just one person who did it, the rest of it is, is, is decline or something would be highly problematic. Okay, now to the actual evidence, right? Um, Manuscripts from the Islamic world uh, are, are great because often they can contain information at the end uh, in their colophones about where they were copied. And sometimes we also get notes stating that they were read uh, in, in specific ways, such as an ijazah or a certificate that I read this with my teacher. And so that's a, a permission for them to then transmit uh, that text further. This is an example from an Oxford manuscript, uh, or I should say a manuscript that is now housed in Oxford. Uh, Emma's Pocock 34 of Ibn Nafis's Epitome of Medicine, which was the primary text. It's called the Mukhtasar, so kind of the introductory text for medicine for people from the 1300s all the way till about the 1900s in learning medicine. It was copied, it states it was copied in Baghdad in a Sufi hospice, uh, a Rebat, in 1318. So here's a medical text used in a cognate madrasa institution, Arabat being another one of these religious uh, uh, institutions, what Magdizi said was not taking place, right? Another example is, um, this is a commentary on that Mukhtasar, uh, uh, the epitome, uh, called the Hal al Mujaz or the Resolution of the Epitome. This is from Herat, and it contains a colophon that basically says this was copied in the Gohar Shad Madrasa of Herat. And this is actually a very fascinating manuscript because it contains marginalia of uh, the next commentator, Al Kirmani's uh, uh, commentary, which was generated by teaching this text to his students. So this Madrasa copied manuscript then has marginalia from a commentator students, which then interject and introduce even more information that Kinemani introduced in correcting some of the stuff from al Aqsarai. Um, here's another example of al Aqsarai's text of the resolution of the epitome. This time, it's, it actually contains one of these Ijaza type certifications. It says, I was succeed, this person says, I was successful in completing the deep reading of this book and, and correcting it from the beginning till the end in the city of Herat, God protected from calamities, in the madrasa of the deceased Sultan, Sultan Hussein Mirza. And then actually, uh, a little bit of it is, is effaced, which talks about the teacher under whom he most likely read it, right? Uh, there are many, many more examples, but these are just three to show the madrasas did not uh, banish medicine or the rational sciences. And of course, there's been a lot of stuff on there. Frank Griffel has a brilliant article on, on the philosophical aspect of those arguments. All right, on to some developments now. Let me start with pulse first. Uh, the Greek physician Galen had maintained that pulse is a motion uh, of the heart and arteries caused by a special power uh, called, and he called it the vital faculty, which makes the heart and arteries expand and contract at the same time. Time, right? Uh, he specifically designed experiments and claimed, this is Galen in the Greek, to show that there is no mechanical push involved. Instead, both there's a fact power that these arteries and heart have uh, that makes them simultaneously contract and simultaneous, uh, simultaneously expand, sorry, and simultaneously contract. Uh, Ibn Sina picked this up in the Canon of Medicine and said the same thing. When Fakhradin Arazi came to commenting on this passage, he only had an issue with Ibn Sina with regards to where he felt that some specific aspects of uh, the definition were left out, which made the definition deficient. And, uh, and this is something that is done in logic and Asad knows a heck of a lot more about this uh, than, than I could ever explain. Uh, and uh, uh, so he comes in and he says, look, I'll give you a full definition. And he says, pulse is a movement in the category of place of the receptacles of the spirit 
issued from the vital faculties composed of expansion and contraction in order to temper the spirit with fresh air. The spirit is not the soul, it is ruh, but this is a physiological, physical spirit in the body, uh, which is a mixture of air and blood, which is how the body, uh, how the soul communicates powers to the body and the body sends those powers out. So for example, if my brain wants to signal to my hand to move, it would send the spirit in the nerves with the power to move. And then the power is actualized with the movement of the actual hand. That's how the, the spirit was understood. Um, there's a, another thing going on. This is movement in the category of place because Fakhadin Arazi says, well, you know, motion, and he's picking up from Ibn Sina here. There are four categories of motion or change, haraka, which is one is quantitative. So think about growth, it would be a kind of quantitative change. Um, a qualitative would be a change from green to brown or hot to cold. Um, they, uh, there's a position in the movement in the category of place, which means that our standard locomotion, I move from one room to the next room. And of course, uh, movement uh, that Ibn Sina had created a category of motion, which he called the category in the uh, motion in the category of position, which means a rotational motion, such as that of a sphere. Now, Ibn Nafis came in. Notice also Fakhreddin Arazi, like Galen, said that receptacles of the spirit is what pulse is, i.e. for them, pulse is the motion of both heart and arteries. And in fact, uh, some even claim the brain pulses, right? That's how they understood pulse. Ibn Nafis comes and changes many aspects of this definition, right? So he says, know that the meaning of pulse in our time is the motion of the arteries without that of the heart. Pulse is a positional motion composed of a forced contraction caused by the expansion of the heart and a natural expansion coinciding with the heart's contraction. Um, to explain all of the stuff that's going on will is basically my first book. Uh, so I'll just refer you uh, to that, but I wanna cut uh, to the chase with some of the long uh, uh, story short here. It is connected of course to his pulmonary transit of, bra of blood, uh, but I wanna highlight a few things. First, Ibn Nafis maintained that the best proof for this position that he's claiming would be to open up and dissect a live animal which he said he's refusing to do for his own ethical kind of and morality uh, or moral concerns with having done that. But he was certain that that's what you do. Fast forward to the 16th century and Real de Colombo, who has the exact same position on pulse as Ibn Nafis, actually did cut open a, a living animal and then confirmed precisely what Ibn Nafis is stating here. Um, then one of the objections he raised against his own theory, Ibn Nafis that is, is he said, well, you know, one may say that if, that if there's a force, right? So as far as he's concerned, the heart contracts, that sends the spirit into the pulse and the, and the artery expands. Well, in that case, the artery closest to the heart should expand first. And then later on, he recognized that there will be this kind of a mechanical motion. And Ibn Nafis comes around and response to that, and, and the critique, sorry, the objection was that, well, we don't feel these differences. And Ibn Nafis comes back and he says, well, you're right, we don't feel these differences. And he says, the reason we don't feel these differences is as follows. He goes, we accept that the expansion of the parts of the artery closest to the heart is before the expansion of those further away. But it is not necessary that this difference be felt. In fact, it necessarily cannot be felt because of the shortness of the duration of the period of expansion and contraction themselves. Then how can one perceive the difference in the contraction and expansion of the various parts? Think about this, you, the pulse beats about 70 to 80 times a minute. Each expansion and contraction that means lasts a fraction of that. Now try to determine with their technology and their time, feeling in a live person that the artery is expanding and contracting differently at different parts, right? And that's what Ibn Nafis is basically saying. He goes, you know, if you cut open a living animal, you'll see it, but, but, but that's not the case. Um, he has many reasons why he proposes it, which I'm not gonna get into because they're actually really, really long, but that inclu includes actually an, an, an interaction with kind of religious and philosophical understandings so of those disciplinary boundaries that we usually set up uh, do, uh, do break down. Um, but I also wanna emphasize so that we don't make a, uh, create a problem here. As far as he's concerned, the heart expands, sucking back the spirit from the arteries, which is what is the active motion. And then the heart relaxes and contracts in his notion in the sense that that's not the heart's active motion, it contracts. And that results in, in, in the spirit returning back to the natural state for the arteries. And why does the heart expand and contract? He says it's not due to the vital faculty, but it's something he calls the natural volitional faculty. 
Uh, again, much more difficult to explain all of this in a short period of time, but it's the equivalent of an involuntary muscle the way we think about it. And it is intriguing that Imran Nafis picks up the heart, the womb, and the stomach. Uh, and the intestines as precisely those involuntary muscles, uh, uh, which is something that uh, 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 Galen had also seen some differences, but did not come up with this involuntary aspect of it. And, and Ibn Nafis does this uh, fascinating category. Now, the one I really want to emphasize actually on, and, and that'll, that'll probably be it, I won't be able to get into the generation discussion, but happy to talk about fetal insolment and generation in the question and answers, but I'll finish with this uh, next point on continuing on in these discussions on Paul's. Notice I mentioned about uh, earlier that Ibn Nafis also talks about the pulse being a positional motion. He had changed the discussion and he said uh, right here, the meaning of the pulse in our time is the motion of the arteries without that of the heart. Pulse is a positional motion composed of a forced contraction, right? I'm gonna come and focus on this part. Uh, um, and again, of course, I'm losing my train of thought. That's why I should read my paper more. Uh, <laughs> before that, all I wanna say is that Ibn Nafis's new theory that it's the heart that expands and the arteries contract when the heart expands is picked up by subsequent physicians. It wasn't lost, it wasn't declined. That's the position that became the norm. You can see it in al Kinamani, who says the meaning of the word pulse according to the custom of the physicians of our time is the movement of the arteries alone, not the heart. A complete movement away from Galen, et cetera. And at the bottom, you'll say many of the ancients, he has, Ibn Nafis assigns this view to the ancients, although uh, it's not entirely accurate, says that its contraction is with the expansion of the heart and its expansion with the contraction of the heart. And this has been chosen by the author and that's how it proceeds. Now, coming to the positional motion part, uh, Ibn Nafis explains that the arteries actually do not move with respect to their mechan or their place, but rather with respect to their wadr or their position. Why would he say that? Well, the reason he says is because the way mechan place was defined by Ibn Sina and of course before him by Aristotle was that it is determined based on the surface that is you're touching or the or contained within the surface that contains something that contains something right the space is determined by what is inside it by the inner limit of the containing one and the external limit of the one that is contained so in the context of the arteries, the arteries, right, touch everything that is outside of them the entire time, right? So that's their place. Now, a definition of, by definition, something that is moving with respect to place means it needs to be displaced, which means that whatever they're touching should not be what they're anymore touching if they are moving with respect to place. And he says, that's not correct because whatever surrounds them before also surrounds them afterwards. So he says, since they're never displaced, this means that they must be moving with respect to position. Well, this resulted in all kinds of discussions in, in natural science, because this is now a physics or natural science discussion, which as Asad pointed out, was the root of uh, uh, science with regards to medicine, which was supposed to be branch and came under the larger kind of hikmah or uh, philosophical uh, 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 sciences. Qutbuddin al immediately picks up on this and says, as for Ibn Nafis saying that whenever a moving body is undergoing motion in the category of place, it must necessarily leave its now, I'm calling it contiguous place or the stuff that it's touching. That it, he says, this is incorrect, Shirazi. He's like, that is because motion in the category of place. And he says, which really should be classified as aniya, which means non-contiguous place, right? So now he's changing up some of the terminology, recognizing that we have a problem with our definition of place with what Ibn Nafis has just said. He goes, is the change in, I'm calling it the whereabouts, or where is someone, aina, of a moving object such that at every instant, the object is somewhere else, not at every instant that it is not touching the same thing that it is touching. What does that mean? Well, the classic example that they're gonna provide, and I think I have this over here, yep, in al Aqsarai, who continues to build on this, is the water inside the cup. Imagine you have water inside the cup and you pick it up and take it from one room to the next. Has the water moved with respect to place or just with respect to position? And of course, these want to, you immediately want to turn and say, well, it used to be in this room, now it's in this other room, so it's clearly moved with respect to place. And that's exactly what al Salai and Shirazi are getting at. They're like, you know, the water inside the cup is moving with respect to place. And if you're talking about contiguous places, then the stone that is at rest in when water is flowing over it would mean that the stone is moving. Right. Whereas actually we know the stone is at rest. Um, 
And so he turns around and says, you know, positional motion and the motion of the arteries is best understood as basically having a circle of people who step back and then step forward. And he goes, that's clearly a movement with respect to the whereabouts of where these people are. And so it's in the category of place. However, the physicians didn't stop there. They continued to then object. Ibn Mubarak came in and he said, the learned scholar objected to this argument, but he goes, uh, then object motion in the category of place, Aenea does not entail its leaving the contiguous place, but rather entails only the changing of its whereabouts, such as the motion of the water in the cup due to the motion of the cup. Such a motion belongs to the category of non-contiguous place, Aenea, even though the water does not leave its container, or its con mechan or contiguous place. However, Ibn Mubarak says, I see that this objection is to be rejected. For the author of Nefis meant to say that the per se motion, i.e. the motion from within uh, the inherent motion or, the, or, or that of the, of, the, of the thing itself in the category of place necessarily requires that the moving body leave its real place, what it's touching. The motion of the water due to the motion of the cup is not per se, but rather per accident, such as the motion of a person sitting on a boat, right? When the boat is moving and the person sitting on a boat, he goes, well, as far as the person is concerned, they're not moving on their own. It's the boat that's moving. And so what you see is a very technical, detailed discussion going on in a medical text of these natural scientific physics discussion, which are the root science, part of philosophical discussions with the relativity of motion and, and these ideas about relative space with respect to what you're touching and not versus where you may be in terms of uh, if I would only be around for a second, I'm not going to accept this notion absolute speed in terms of a very anachronistic understanding, but the idea is where something is, right? So um, I don't have, as I said, time to go over a generation. So I'm just going to wrap up with um, a couple of uh, conclusions. This is just showing you a manuscript uh, that I mentioned in the Herat. On the left-hand side where you see this red line going through is where the uh, students have plopped a lot of discussion uh, into their uh, copied text of this madrasa text uh, from al kirmani where al kirmani then disagrees with Aqsa'i as well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, as I said, quickly skip over all this generation part and just do the conclusion. Um, there's a lot more I could say with regards to these various topics. Uh, hopefully you can see some examples of how medicine and post-classical Islamic societies did not go into irreversible decline. Medical ch writers challenged Greek thought and modified many aspects of Greek medical theory and practice. They continue to engage with philosophy and even at times theology, which I didn't get to, which would have been in the generation aspects uh, with fetal ensoulment. Medical works were available in madrasas and often, uh, uh, and often read by religious scholars. Excuse me, religious scholars. I gave the example from generation. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Um, one could even add to generation, even notions about pandemic. And given our current pandemic, there are discussions in plague that change from the medical texts and how they're reflected then in the religious texts. Um, reason and revelation um, remained intertwined, but naturally the extent, and this is the key point I would probably build upon what Asad said, but naturally to the extent to which each scholar engaged with what they classified as hikmah, what they classified as the shara'i and what they classified as lib, uh, uh, you know, there were differences. We need to recognize that there were many different competing positions in the classification of the sciences, in the philosophical, or I should say, in the arguments within each of the knowledge disciplines that we have and their traditions. And there was not one unique answer for any given issue. Although at times those could emerge, such as that the heart uh, is no longer deemed to be pulsing, but it's actually just the arteries uh, that is picked up. Um, always keep in mind, uh, as my parting thought, that reason and revelation or science and religion, even in our post enlightenment categories are never in conflict or in harmony. It is rational and religious scholars or scientists and religious scholars who may disagree or agree on specific messages or issues. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um... That one of the things that I love about the, the, the presentations and the group that's here is that we have a, really a deep dive into some of the technicalities, but also we've got a range of people in the audience that I want to try to bring this to everybody's level. I have not <laughs> done any level close to the deep dive that you guys have done in my own studies. So I, I would like to ask a question sort of at the layperson level, and then we have some questions that are a little bit more uh, expertise, it sounds like. So if you guys will bear with me, I'm going to try to get to sort of the generic sort of how does this matter to contemporary Muslims kind of questions. Um, um, and then I've got some questions from some audience that seems clearly that they're more expert than, than I. So on the one hand, I mean, 
So the title, Reason and Revelation, uh, gets to a conversation of categories, and you both have talked about categorization and the post-enlightenment categorization. And, and I think that most of the audience here is aware that there are lots of sort of descriptions of Islam and Islam and science that tend, that we know use these Western post-enlightenment categories, but they also tend to, I think, stereotype things also from the perspective of, of Western sort of, these things are in conflict and that there's, I just heard a recent quote of Neil deGrasse Tyson from a few years ago saying, well, the problem with Muslims and science is that after Ghazali, they just all did only religious study and they never did any rational thinking and that's why math is so bad and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'd like you both to, to answer sort of how, how does what you just presented give the average listener some insight into to how to respond to those kinds of stereotypes. I mean, you give lots of detail, but there's some, some of the questions here we're asking, for example, is reason a useful category, right? Should we even use that term? Or is there a hierarchy in categories, revelatory versus reason? How do those relate to each other? Um, how, how should we think about them relating to each other? And, and which parts of these categories are unhelpful in your mind, specifically to how we talk about it? And how would, how would you suggest we talk about it today? So the average Muslim who has some sense of science, they took physics in high school, you know, they kind of know something about Ibn Sina, but, but the rest of it is really, really detailed. What, what does what you've just offered give them some more information that they could use? Either one of you, whoever want to start. Go ahead, Nahan. Nahan, please. I insist. I, I, I was uh, saying pehle aap to, uh, 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 so. <laughs> so, so I, first. <laughs> I, I can, uh, thank you Asfa for that, uh, and, and, and Nahyan for that wonderful presentation, uh, uh, and Asifa for that, for that important question. Um, I think one of the difficulties I face, and perhaps Nahyan also, although I shouldn't speak for him, is that uh, we try to reconstruct, uh, you know, the responses to broader questions out of these uh, weeds, out of these details, and sometimes we forget what the larger point might be for, uh, yeah, for us. So. Um, there is a, certainly a distinction in the Islamic tradition between aqli and naqli disciplines, right? So aqli is often translated as reason-based or rational disciplines and naqli as transmitted disciplines. Uh, the former often includes things like astronomy and philosophy and so on. Again, whatever the term philosophy might mean. Um, and the, the latter often includes things like Quranic studies and so on. What Nahyan was pointing out, uh, first of all, and, and I agree with that, is that the categories do tend to be not entirely, um, um, uh, don't, don't tend to have exactly hard borders. You know, the, these are epistemological categories that are meant to classify, contain, and explain knowledge systems, but there's interaction that happens too. Uh, the position that I do maintain is that uh, where I might uh, some, somewhat disagree with Nahyan is that in, in certain cases, uh, although there is an overlap, there is a certain uh, directionality of, of influence. So in my, in my readings in text and logic, for example, I've never seen the influence of the Ishraqi tradition, for example. Uh, although the Ishraqis on the other hand do use uh, the tradition of logic to, uh, to elaborate on their points and so on. Um, so first of all, there's, there's a category, aqli and naqli, rational, transmitted, sure, it's problematic. It's already in the Islamic tradition, but the way in Muslim scholarship function already problematizes it. Um, the second thing too, and, and this, is, this is the main thing I want to say, is that the question of reason revelation really is a question about what the starting point of a particular investigation is. Um, um, if you look at uh, this work by Urmawi called Al-Farq, uh, by now, was it Edmund Kalam wal, uh, wal Edmund Elahi, uh, which was brought to my attention first by Hydrun Eichner's work and then later on by actually a Bayan colleague, Fuad al uh, You would find there that they lay out the objectives of the two disciplines, right? So, discipline of uh, Muslim theology versus the discipline of first philosophy or metaphysics. Uh, the, the distinction is drawn on the basis of what the starting point and objectives are of both disciplines. They may end up with the same conclusions. But as pointed out in the case of Kalam or, or Islamic theology, the aim is to look at the existence of this world so that they may point to a creator. So the objective is already set. Um, in the case of uh, first philosophy or metaphysics, that objective is not in place. So at the end of the day, you would, you would notice that philosophers like Avicenna would conclude the same as the Mutakallimun, the Muslim theologians, that there is one necessary being. In fact, the Muslim theologians adopt that expression too. But the question is, 
again, the question of epistemology, what is the starting point and the ultimate objective? So uh, the answer to your question is when the question is asked about the fate of reason in Islam, again, precision matters. It matters that what the objective of a particular scholar is. They're not at clash with each other. There are, it seems to be alternative methodologies and epistemologies in place. Um, and there seems to be, you know, there doesn't seem to be, in my view, a clear muddying of the different disciplines and the way they operate. So anyway, that's a long-winded response to your important question. Um, Nahan, what'd you do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, my, my, my quick response in, in, in uh, well, I don't know if I can make a quick response, but what I'll say is that one of the things just in a commonsensical way one can think about, right? When you have this category of being irrational, right? Or, 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 or reasonable, who wants to be irrational and unreasonable, right? Uh, now the crucial part is how many truth claims can you feel? I mean, so they always, they also have this notion of, you know, a, if you know someone is the truth or speaks the truth or is a truth giver, right? Then it is just rational to accept that that thing or that person is the truth, is bears the truth or, you know, or, or, or makes true claims. Um, so as far as I've always seen it, I've seen these distinctions being made. I mean, and, and again, because the classification schemes are always changed and, and, and differ, right? So someone like Ibn Nafis will come around and say that, oh, you know, uh, rational disciplines includes uh, or, uh, sorry, I should say the Nakli disciplines or the transmitted disciplines, right? Um, uh, he calls them Sama'iya, right? The kind of received ones. Uh, actually also use rational premises and, and rational argumentation. The only difference is that they take as accepted truths some principles, right? And those ex are coming from authorities, right? Who, who are accepted as that. And he goes, after that, you know, the, the stuff goes in. Uh, I agree with us that uh, uh, on the part that he made that some traditions may have, may not, may be more unidirectional, the influence of the other, right? Uh, or, or each tradition may have its own set of goals and premises that they're looking at and building upon. But uh, I would still say that there's a lot more interaction and, 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 and peeking over and looking at what's going on, uh, then, then sometimes uh, we give credit. Now, in terms of the contemporary person, what I will say, well, I'll, I'll say a, a couple of things and, and maybe I made the bad choice of going with the pulse example rather than the generation example, right, for modern Muslims. Um, what I would uh, um, argue for, or for a modern Muslim are, are a few things. One, stop reading books that were, you know, are relying on research that's about a hundred years old. And sadly, Google Books makes things, those, that research much more accessible than the more recent ones, right? So both sides bear the blame that we should be writing more for popular audiences as well versus, or making things more widely available. I know my actually work is widely available on my website that people can download. I think Asad does too and on his academia page and, and, and many others are doing that nowadays, right? Um, so that's the first one that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, stop, relying on some of those sorts of things. Um, there is a lot of development and engagement with rational disciplines that went way, way, way beyond Ibn Sina. And that entire story needs to be told because most of those texts haven't even been read, right, uh, is, is the crucial part. Uh, we need to stop thinking about science as a unidirectional movement, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that once you have Aristotle, you have to arrive at Newton. Uh, which is the case even in the contemporary context. And a lot of people struggle to understand what that may even mean, but that's actually a crucial point as you dive in to try to see what, what these things were, what people were doing. And finally, and for me, this is actually a big one, which is why I'm now really kicking myself and not doing the generation example, right? Is that many of these legal scholars, this is the real big takeaway for modern Muslims, right? Many of the legal scholars and religious scholars in the past were well-versed or versed enough in these debates, so I'll give an example from generation, right? When they're coming in and trying to understand within the Hadith and the, and the Quranic texts about how do we think about things such as contraception, abortion, um, uh, um, timing of fetal ensoulment, uh, you know, and, and, and various other aspects related to generation. They were reading and keeping up also with some of the medical discussions and the physics discussions taking place in that topic, right? And then coming to their conclusions 
at least being aware of it. So even if they're challenging it, they're at least aware of what that medical tradition might say, right? And then sometimes their medical, their religious fatawa are actually premised on very clear medical understandings, right? So as modern Muslims, when you go and dig up, so in the contemporary context of brain dead, is that, you know, does that count as death? And you get a fatwa that turns around and says, oh yeah, because the soul is associated with the brain. They need to understand that the person's fatwa that they're picking up on is actually an internal medical discussion and science discussion taking place in the 12th and the 13th century in terms of whether the brain is a chief organ or the heart. And you have a religious scholar who's decided to pick the brain in that case or the heart in that case, or what that relationship is. Now, if you don't know that that's what happened back then, and you're just gonna just pick and choose and pick it up here, that's a problem. Second, you need to know the, if you really wanna follow their precedents, you need to engage with contemporary science and have a much better understanding of what's going on here as well, as you try to dig through and work your way through reason and revelation. And on the larger epistemological question, recognize that yes, they value these rational argumentations and whatever was going on in these Apli disciplines and they imported, borrowed, challenged, questioned, you know, based on those sorts of things. So that would be my big takeaway for how to deal with it now. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just that one example, I teach constitutional law among other things and I just finished teaching um, the abortion cases. And so you see even in the West, the Supreme Court between Roe versus Wade and then, then the Casey case, they're, they're wrestling with the science involved in pregnancy as part of their decision-making about the fundamental rights that they're having to deal with. So of course that there would be a conversation between them and a watching between them. And I love that both of you gave evidence that the, that the educational disciplines of all these fields were cross-pollinating each other, which is really a very important thing to remember, which actually gets to one question that I've got here to read. So now I'm getting into people who know a little bit more about this stuff than I. So here's a question from Fuad. How much of post-classical Islamic astronomy would you say was limited by commitments to the Mutakalimun of that era had made to the natural philosophy of the philosopher? i.e. a realist ontology and or other foundational commitments. I understand this to be well, how much of, you know, in that peeking over thing that you're talking about, how much of it is controlled by what was happening in Kalam. I'll read it again. You got it? Got the question? I think so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Fouad. Nice to have you here. Uh, this is actually a, a, a point that we were discussing in the last class on astronomy that we had yesterday with the, the grad students, and I think some of them might be here. Um, so it is of course true that there are, um, there's one side that, side that peaks over the other side. And by that, I mean one same scholar who sometimes has his hat on as a faqih and sometimes has his hat on uh, as, as a, you know, as a mutakallim. Um, so that certainly is true. What I was stressing in my uh, talk and which is going to be relevant to, to my response is uh, that th there seems to be a strong directionality of influence uh, from one type of discipline to the other type of discipline. Um, and of course, though you see uh, uh, you know, the, the influence coming the other way around too, that the latter is more rare. So uh, the examples that, that were given by you, Asifa, for example, and some of the ones that were given by Nahyan, um, it is in fact true that of course, medical practice and one's understanding of the cosmos as developed in astronomy and so on would have an influence on, on one's uh, legal positions too. But I, for example, have not seen um, too frequently, very, very rarely would I, would I see an example of what the outcome of a legal uh, debate might be um, uh, or, or, or certain perceptions of you know, rhetorical or, or allegorical perceptions of the universe to feed back into uh, these ugly disciplines. So that's, uh, that's a position that I think I hold at this point, uh, though of course there are overlaps and the same scholar would be working in both disciplines. So now this, this relates to what Fuad is asking. The text we were looking at yesterday, uh, which I didn't show you guys today, uh, is one that I've been thinking about for several years and it was actually used and explored by uh, Jamil Rajib in his article on the uh, uh, the freeing, freeing astronomy from philosophy article, a very influential article. And uh, there is a, the question that you're asking is res has response in what E.G. is doing in his Mawakif and the response that Jujani gives him. So E.G. points out, uh, uh, I'll give a summary because it's a complicated text and I actually disagree in my interpretation with Rajib's uh, fine article. Uh, E.G. says in his, in his uh, 
theology book, right? This is the Mawaqif Fi Alm Al Kalam. He says that uh, I am presenting uh, aspects of astronomy in my work so that you, the reader, may understand certain important uh, aspects of the objectives of the astronomers. And he says, then he says, if you think about these things, these objectives of the astronomers and what they say, uh, to be mere imaginings on their part, uh, nothing more than loud sounds that are made, you would find them to be weaker or thinner than the spider's web, which immediately should remind all of you of the Quranic uh, expression from the spider chapter, Yan Kabut. Yeah? Um, and then, so, so this seems to give the impression that the theologian actually does not believe in the truths of astronomy, that what astronomers are doing out there. And then Giorgiani, his commentator, comes along and he points out that, well, and this is the interesting part, I think. He says, okay, uh, let's imagine an orb and let's imagine that orb spinning in place. So this is the haraka vadaya that Nahyan was talking about, right? Motion with respect to, not uh, position, sorry, with respect to position, not with respect to place. And uh, once you have posited that, the following would be true. You would have to uh, posit uh, that there are two points on this orb that are not spinning. He calls them the poles. He says you'll also be forced to posit that there is a, uh, a if you posit a point um, in the center of this globe on the equator, that point is going to move, be moving faster than the point that is closer to the pole because obviously it's traversing a greater distance in the same time. And he posits a whole bunch of things that would follow from the initial mental posit of a spinning orb. And then he says that at that point that these are all things that once you have the initial posit of a spinning orb that will be true with, in virtue of the given posit. So in other words, there are certain realities and truths that follow in virtue of our mathematical posit. If a simple thing, then other things will follow in virtue of that very posit. He calls it finafs al-amr, and that's my translation of that. Now he says the following, and th this is where th you know, um, the response to Fuad will become more clear. He says that it is by means of these things which are, do not exist extramentally. He, I, he says that I cannot, even if these mathematical things that I've just presented to you do not exist extramentally, it is by means of these things that one can come to understand and capture the states of what is happening in the heavens and the earth. So where, where does that leave us? Uh, well, he says this is precisely what E.G.'s point is. And what E.G. is saying is if you take the spider astronomy as a spider's web to be an idol, the way it's presented you know, in the Quran, and you take it to be firmly established as opposed to a tool that might lead you to the appreciation of the cosmos, then you'll be in error. But if you take it as a tool, a mathematical object whereby you can understand, for example, the general regularity of the world and realize that God has created the world with, you know, with, with a regularity and a certain kind of uh, uh, you know, singular mode of being, uh, you might have, you know, the point is that you might have various different mathematical models all of which will lead you to understand that there is something wondrous in the world. So the, the theologians don't reject astronomy. They also don't seem to affirm it as a necessary model that can be modeled upon the experimental reality. Uh, you know, just as you know, there seems to be an epistemological gap between presenting a, ma a mental mathematical model and then claiming that this model, this one right here is the one that reflects reality out there. So this is a, what Rajiv calls a compromise and what I call some, actually a, call, a, a student of mine in the last discussion called something like structural realism. And the, the theologians are very happy to engage in that kind of structural realism. So there's no clash. The, the basic, the short answer is there seems to be no clash. They're willing to do the work of astronomy provided they leave the possibilities open of various models explaining the wonders of the world and its regularity. Would you, Add to that, Nahan, or should I go on to the next question? No, there's an astronomy that okay. I think also yeah. well, These are similar, kind of connected to that. So here's another one. This is from Ala uh, Al Ghabri. Um, Given the classification of disciplines and their distinctive epistemologies that Professor Asad Ahmed described, how do we make sense of the sites where there occurs an intersection between these disciplines? How is this intersection epistemologically organized? Yeah, Nahyan, I wonder if you're, in, I mean, certainly in a better position, because I, I certainly notice sites of intersection, but as I was pointing out, I also see a unidirectionality. Uh, generally speaking, of course, not always, uh, but Nahyan's work has really opened him. The last book opened up, uh, you know, our, you know a, a way of thinking about medicine insofar as it is influenced by 
a certain mm -hmm. kind of theological doctrines and so on. So Nayan, perhaps this is, if you have a better for word you? for you to handle. Sure, uh, I mean, I think, so the inter intersections, actually, uh, could you repeat the question again? I, there's sure. A part that we, given we the, got, yeah. yeah, given the classification of disciplines and their distinctive epistemologies that Professor Asad Ahmed described, how do we make sense of the sites where there occurs an intersection between these disciplines? How is this intersection epistemologically organized? <laughs> So the epistemological organization, I don't know how much I've thought about that apart from the, 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 the fact of at times, right? I mean, the, uh, I've been thinking a bit more about the uh, epistemological organization more recently as I've been working on, on my current book projects. So I'll, 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 I'll give a hint maybe on that one and then go to a, a concrete example, right? Uh, so in a famous passage in Ibn Sina's Qanun, he says, well, you know, there are certain things, uh, the, you know, like every other science, and, and Nasa knows this really well and can explain it even better, subject, there's, every science is a subject matter and certain premises which it needs in order to get off the ground, and then you build propositions and, and kind of prove truths out of it, right? And uh, Ibn Sina lists a whole bunch of them right in the beginning of the Qanun, uh, which medicine deals with, and ranging from the elements and temperaments and humors all the way down to treating individual um, uh, diseases, right? Classes of diseases with uh, individual classes of medications. And Ibn Sina says, well, some of these actually, they're tasawwurat, they're conceptualization. And he says, you know, the conceptualization of them, the tasawwurat, how, you know, uh, are, it's necessary incumbent upon the physician qua physician to have them, right? But on some subject matters, they're heliya, or, you know, do they exist? Uh, and assenting to their existence, tasdiq, should be taken for granted from elements uh, in, in the higher science. Now, in the past, this has been uh, interpreted by people that somehow all of what forms medical theory was off limits to the physician because uh, these were just matters accepted as being, because assent means accepting to something is true or false or passing judgment on them, that all of these were accepted by physicians from earlier science that they would not actually debate any elements of it, right? But this is where it turns out that the commentators did not interpret it that way, right? What they accepted it as was that literally that, that there are four humors or that there is such a thing as a humor, not even four humors necessarily, is accepted from physics. But what they are, whether their definition and how Ibn Sina has defined them and whether that's a correct definition or not, and what all goes on in terms of how they're generated and stuff is precisely the kind of investigation that the physician undertakes. Uh, and in fact, there's a big discussion in the commentaries that even comes out and says, even the elements is something that the physician can investigate within their own rights. Now, this is now starting to get into that epistemological question of, you know, what are you just doing? Because you're a root, you're a branch science and, and this, how does this fit, right? So this is just my nod towards that something's happening interestingly epistemologically without, you know, understanding a lot fully and, and, and what's going on. On the concrete example, uh, what I'd say is where, uh, so, Again, the, the generation example, well, I mean, I can even pick up the philosophical example, right? The fact that they're having these major discussions on Aenea and Mechania and how do we now start to conceptualize space, right? What's fascinating to me, and I haven't followed this up in the philosophical discussions because these discussions are extensive in these medical texts, but at no point so far have I, and Asad might be able to guide me if he's come across them in the early period, the earliest I found any reference to shifting to Aenea is with Shirazi's own teacher, Tusi. And even there, he doesn't say much, right? It, it turns out that Shirazi is the one in responding to Ibn Nafis in his medical commentary that he starts going into these distinctions far more carefully, which then are clearly, I think, going to enter into dialogue with what's going on in, in, in physics, at least the way I see them then keep coming up, right? Uh, but I haven't gone into the physics tradition to see what, what is actually going on. So that will, if there is something going on over there, that would be an example of this kind of uh, crossing in the boundaries. On the religious element, uh, we see it quite a bit in, with fetal uh, 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 insolment and generation kinds of issues. And I have an article where I even show that it's fascinating that even Ibn Sina, when he came to understand, I mean, this is something that comes up in John McGuinness's uh, book on Avicenna. It's a, it's a short, it's a, it's a solid read actually to get a sense of some of his uh, Ibn Sina's positions. And he talks about uh, Ibn Sina's understanding of physics, particularly uh, how do we understand change from one thing to the next? And Ibn Sina has new understandings of that. And what's fascinating is that he gives the example of fetal, and so, of fetal generation as his example, 
where he says basically that the fetus stays in the state of mutfa for these many days and then instantly changes to alaqa. And he uses the Quranic terms, which is intriguing. Uh, mm -hmm. And that he also makes them very distinct stages rather than you know, the way, I mean, he's of course doing it within an Aristotelian context and, and his building upon it, et cetera. But as then it proceeds on, the physicians and the religious scholars then pick this up, but it also then results in some problems because the physicians then want to maintain that the entire stage is a complete by 40 days. Uh, and then there's that hadith that says 120 days, right? And so, the, so fetal generation then brings up these both conflicts and borrowings that go all over the place, including the final part that I, which again, I didn't present on it, but um, the medical commentator Ibn al-Mubarak at the end, as he's discussing in his medical text, uh, notions about fetal ensoulment, he will then bring, bring in uh, the commentary by Ali Qushji on Tusi's Kalam text, Tajrid uh, al-Atakhad, to give the final understanding uh, or explanation for why Ibn Nafis's particular position on this is incorrect. And in fact, you know, fetal insolment is, or fetal generation is governed by the mother's soul, right? Which is a position that emerges again, stuff that it, it didn't go. To. So I see a lot of, yeah, in terms of how, how they're doing, I haven't mm -hmm. figured out the epistemological aspects yet. Thank you. So we have six minutes for a few more questions. I'm going to try to combine a few because some of them are more like referencing your sources kind of questions. So I think that might be helpful to put those together. So this is from Matthew Melvin Kushki um, um, says to us said, a fascinating classification. As it happens, it's the same overall scheme given by in his encyclopedia Miftah Saada, in particular following Ibn Turka and so explicitly less letterist the ascending hierarchy, visual, oral, mental, essential. It seems to likewise be pro-occultist, at least on the natural sciences front. Do you think it's likely that Tasco Persade might be his direct source or rather represents the standardization of this schema throughout the Persianate world from the 16th century onward? That's for Assad. Um, there is also this question for, let's see if I can find it again. Um, uh, Dr. Fancy, are you or anyone else working on translating the many texts that you listed, or do you think translation should await further scholarly examination so that the evolution of categories and terminology is clarified? I have two more, more broad questions, but let me just ask those two because they're kind of about your about your specific texts. That's the you need to unmute. Oh. There you Thank go. you, Matt, for that for that question. Uh, wait, what's happening here? Okay. Anyway, um, I you're got good. some kind of. Okay. Uh, yeah, Matt, thank you for that question. Um, so yeah, you're right. Actually, in, in, in the opening uh, lines or opening chapter or something of the Abjad, uh, Sadiq Hassan Khan uh, tells us the sources that he's using, and he actually points out that Tashko Brizade is Miftah Saada is one of the ones he uses. Uh, but then he says that he studies it through the Madinat al-Ulum of Muhammad ibn Qutb al uh, Azniqi, uh, so which, as you know, is a redaction <clears throat> of that encyclopedia. So it's, uh, it's, it's what, what he's presenting in his text does not always map on to the Miftah uh, because it's being uh, redacted and being looked at through the lens of, of uh, Azniqi. Uh, but yes, that was a good, uh, that was a perfect identification. Yeah, um, and he gives a, we use a whole range of other earlier sources to, to provide the various classifications, most of which obviously I didn't present. Uh, he does present the Miftahs. Uh, as regarding the second question, I, um, it's this is this is a um, a system of classification that you see already in, in the Irshad of Juaini and then of course in Avicenna and in other places. So what we have is you're moving from Kitaba, which is a mode of signifying expressions, um, which which themselves signify uh, mental objects, which themselves signify extra mental realities. So I, I personally don't see any uh, uh, occultist or letterist inclination here because the history predates it. Um, you know, goes all the way back to. Uh, Avicenna. So this is a pretty standard presentation of how the different uh, ontological uh, modulations are present, right? Uh, writing as a signifier for speech, which is a signifier for a mental meaning, which is a signifier for extra mental. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, of course, it's mediated by in Turka too, but in this particular case, it seems to map on pretty nicely to, um, to texts uh, uh, of, uh, of Avicenna and others uh, preceding Ibn Turka. So that's my position, I think. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. Add, yeah, and translation. 
Yeah, the translation, and of course, just adding Ibn Nafis has a similar classification that, uh, that yeah. Asad was just uh, talking about as well. So again, predating um, the, that Ibn Turka. Uh, so um, on, on the translation, uh, these are massive texts. They haven't even been edited or anything. So uh, the translations, I, I, I am actually translating them as I go through because uh, uh, my, my Arabic skills are not as, as good as, as Asad's. Uh, so I need to translate them. Uh, uh, to really understand what's going on, but I don't think I have any plans right now to publish any translations, apart from, of course, whatever gets published as part of my work with chunks of translation, which I end up doing uh, most recently. For example, if you're interested, anyone, you can go to my website and pick up the article that came out early this year on verification and utility. And if you wanna find a neat experiment that Ibn Nafis has done, Ibn Nafis done uh, controlled experiment on the tasir or the, you know, what it's, uh, the, whether it's, potentially hot or cold, uh, snowy water, and what its effect on the body is. So there's this massive controlled experiment that just plopped into the article as a translation. So that's the kind of translation I'm doing. But For nothing. ease of access, do you mind putting your link in the chat? For I can your do that, stuff? yes. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. We do have one minute and there are two questions and I, I suspect that they're not easy, quick answers, but if there's like last thoughts that you might be able to work into these questions, I'm just gonna read the two of them. This is from Sundus. Um, is there a chance that philosophy as a concept is deemed foreign because Muslims always look for an original or authentic term as hikmah instead to be better utilized? Do we really need to instigate the discussion about importance of philosophy in curricular learning as Muslims contributing to knowledge development? Um, and then from Ali Reza, a follow-up to our earlier conversation about reason, which is sort of related. He says, um, I was curious about the comparative value of reason as a concept. If philosophy and science are problematic for the very for the reasons the speakers identified, what do you think of reason? Certainly there is a diversity of conceptualization of reason, rationality and the act of reasoning, its relation to logic, et cetera. But can we identify either something common among these diverse conceptualizations, say what aql is or some family resemblance between them? This may provide a way out of the quagmire of identifying what counts or doesn't count as science or philosophy. And this is perfectly compatible with accepting that nukli sciences are also dependent on reason. One line in response wow. to any of that. Those are big right. questions. <laughs> we'll give you each last thoughts. If you want to answer those questions in your last thoughts, fine. Otherwise, that's a huge topic. Maybe we'll have to come back again and well, answer I, other questions of this question. I, I know, I know uh, at least one of, because I don't know who, which Ali Reza this is. I know at least one of uh, the, the person who's asked me the question, uh, asked us the question. So I'll who's be happy to chat with them. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So I know both of them. <laughs> so, okay. So, so we, we can follow them separately. Them. <laughs> I think what, what I would say, and may, it doesn't really respond to the, to the questions, important questions that are being asked, but what I would say is that, it again depends on the angle that, that you are you know, deploying, because of course, reason, reasoning and premises uh, um, that are methods of reasoning and premises that we deploy in any investigation ultimately can also be looked at from, uh, you know, from the perspective of critical theory. And then that of course changes the entire framework of inquiry. And, and so now you're doing some kind of a metacritical critique of reason. So, I mean, it, it's a complicated question and I, I don't think I can do justice to it. What I, what, what I, I'm, you know, not directly related to that, what I would say is that when we are investigating, for example, the place of reason in let's say Nakli disciplines or, or the place of Nakliyat in so-called Akli disciplines, I think it's important to keep in mind how a particular scholar is arguing. So the, in the Khulasat al-Hisab, and I can give this as a quick example, in the Khulasat al-Hisab, uh, there's a discussion about points, right? The, 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 the geometrical object that we call points. And they are supposed to be the infinitesimally small things that are further divisible even further. So they should not actually technically exist extramentally. They are supposed to be simply mental concoction. So in that particular uh, discussion on, on a treatise on mathematics, right? Uh, the giving going along with what Nahyan was saying, the author brings forward the discussion from Kalam that I presented. They say, well, uh, as we had in the case of the Mawaqif and response by Jurjani that we have a spinning globe and it has certain features in virtue of its very given self uh, once it's been posited. So similarly, you can argue the same way about the point. Uh, here, what I would like to stress is that I would not say that the scholar is arguing in a Kalami or theological fashion, right? You can have discussions within medicine that are geometrical. A round wound would settle and, and heal 
um, uh, more slowly than a wound that's not round because the argument, the geometrical argument as Avicenna presents in one of his work is that you're arguing now geometrically, not medically. So even when there are these overlaps that happen between ugly and knuckly and back and forth, again, the, the keeping in mind what the mode of argumentation is, regardless of where the text, uh, the, the quote comes from or the premise comes from would be important. I think these kinds of ways of highlighting and outlining thing would help us understand how these disciplines are relating to each other and how reason is being used and rationality is being used and so on. So I think that's a some broad yeah, response. I know, I put you on, that was an unfair question for me to throw at the end there. Um, Nahan, any last thoughts? Um, no, I think I think we're fine. <laughs> yes, I don't know if I can do any justice to, uh, to the large part. Uh, yeah, to the large part. Um, I mean, the only part I think that, uh, that came to me is that sometimes and I, again, just just to uh, uh, make that point about how we understand particular terms in specific contexts is as much determined by the particular disciplinary tradition we are in, as it is by you know either peeking over or recognizing even right that this may not be exactly how the mm -hmm. other one is. So to give an example on ruh. Right. As soon as the medical discussions begin on Ruh, they'll start saying, well, this is not the Ruh that is discussed in the religious texts, right? right. Just straight up. And then they'll go ahead with their thing. But what's fascinating is that when you get into some, some of the religious texts, such as Ibn Qayyim al Jazi and stuff, they're of course going to use Ruh the way they have in terms of the hadith and things. But then you start seeing the fascinating overlaps, right, as well. So uh, the, the key, again, on fetal insolment is. Uh, Ibn Qayyim al Jazia in his commentary on the oaths of the Quran, so the Tibian text, right, will come out and say uh, that, um, you know, the physicians all uh, uh, say that they have a, and which is correct, right, there's this notion about how how long it takes for the fetus to get articulated, that it's fully human in shape, and they say it's 40 days after conception, uh, so by modern count that is nine weeks approximately, right? Uh, and they'll say it's fully articulated at that point and then say, they'll say double that time uh, and that's when it starts moving on its own. And moving on its own means then for them that the fetus now has its own soul because it has no volitional motion. When you get into Ibn Qayyim al-Juziyah, he'll turn around and say, he goes, well, they say that, but they really don't know the notion about when it's ensouled, uh, right? That's actually more an, a, a point about religious stuff and he'll maintain it's 120 days. So he comes out. So this is the part where I say that he really wants to engage with them, right? He says, well, the fetus may move before 120 days, but it's not because of its own movement, but it's because of the womb and the movements in it. So you recognize that the way he's understanding ensoulment is entirely you know, in dialogue with how those guys are understanding ensoulment. Yeah. So that's what I would say, right? Some of the stuff that comes up. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I had several people, thank you for all of you who are sticking around to this last overlap. I had several people who had to leave. Thank you both really, really profusely for this very, very enlightening and deep thought thinking presentation. Um, and uh, Bayan, thanks you. Uh, and uh, um, Middle East Studies at Berkeley, thanks you. Um, we wanted to just let everyone know that our January event um, is coming up, inshallah, soon on the topic of Islam and the environment. We're hoping to keep that date, January 25th. So mark that on your calendars. We'll announce the speakers soon. We're also hoping at some point this year to have a special arrangement for Bayan and Berkeley students to participate in a special access kind of opportunity. So keep an, my eye out for that if you're a current student um, at either institution. And um, I'd like to just close um, by thanking everyone for their time and the speakers and all of the administrative staff that helped make this possible. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month, inshallah.